Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is November 14, 1975, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6. As I speak to you today, the four Rockefeller brothers, David, Nelson, John D. III, and Lawrence, operating as a unit, are nearing the goal line in their merciless drive to enslave America. Even so, as I discussed in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 2 for July 1975, they have been partially tripped up recently by unexpected obstacles, both here and abroad, obstacles caused by your increasing awareness of what is going on. Their grip on the ball has been loosened a trifle, and they are beginning to lose their balance. They can be stopped, but this will only happen if each of us keeps doing our part, spreading the word by all possible means about what is happening. Otherwise they still can and will reach their goal line of dictatorship. One thing we should always keep in mind is that you and I are not alone in this fight. There are many, many members of the United States Intelligence Service who do not agree with the horrendous perversion of their activities that is going on under the control of the Rockefeller Brothers. So they give me information and I pass it on to you. I'm fighting on their behalf, among other things, especially for over 500 ex-CIA and ex-FBI officers and agents who are now dead on file, agents who were part of Operation Deep Freeze. Last month I mentioned the electronic technique of psychological programming which are now in use. Similar techniques are used on agents themselves in Operation Deep Freeze enabling them to assume false identity so completely that they can even pass lie detector tests. They are programmed this way for an assignment and are supposed to be deprogrammed afterward, releasing their minds from this artificial state. But some of these agents have been double-crossed by the CIA and FBI for certain reasons, pronounced dead on file and dumped out on the street without being deprogrammed. They are left without access to jobs, welfare, or in, we in most cases even their families. Many of those in this situation are the very men who most want what is right for America, not for the international conquests of the Rockefellers, and therefore I am fighting their fight as best I can. The three topics I want to discuss today parallel the three AUDIO BOOKS that I have recorded so far for AUDIO BOOKS Incorporated. In those I have tried to give you essential background information. In my monthly AUDIO LETTERS, on the other hand, I am trying to keep you continually informed of the latest plans and developments on a current events basis. My first AUDIO BOOK, released October 1974, warned of the coming depression and war, and today my topic No. 1 is the Ford Depression, Asian War, and the impending doom of the OPEC nations. My second AUDIO BOOK, released March 1975, explained the Fort Knox Gold Scandal and its crucial role in destroying our economy and our Republic, and today my topic No. 2 is Fort Knox Plutonium and our sellout by Congress. My third AUDIO BOOK, released July 1975, tells you all about the new Constitution which has already been written secretly for America's conversion into a dictatorship, and today my topic No. 3 is Gerald Ford's Last Days as President. Topic No. 1. Last month in my AUDIO LETTER No. 5 I explained how the four Rockefeller Brothers are preparing to sacrifice New York City as one way of triggering what will be called the Ford Depression, and on October 17, 1975, a dress rehearsal was held for the default of New York City. Sudden news bulletins the previous day said that New York City was on the brink of default, and for 24 hours the TV and radio news was filled with dire speculations about what might happen. 
The cliffhanger ended with a default being avoided only by a matter of minutes, and in the process the financial term default was transformed into a household word and a frightening one at that. For weeks President Ford and his spokesman had been opposing any Federal aid to prevent default, and so had Vice President Nelson Rockefeller. That is, until October 1, October 11, 1975, just a week before the near default in New York. On that date, October 11, Rockefeller suddenly launched a public campaign of speaking in favor of aid to New York, even while still working behind the scenes in Congress and the banking community to prevent it. Thus began the carefully orchestrated public split between Ford and Rockefeller, that is, to leave Ford holding the bag when our financial catastrophe arrives very shortly. Twelve days later, on October 29, Ford crawled out still further on the limb that Rockefeller is sawing off by announcing that he would absolutely veto any kind of legislation Congress might send him to bail out New York City. And only four days after that, Rockefeller put further distance between himself and his lackey Ford by removing himself from the Vice Presidential ticket for next year. Many people are falling right into Nelson Rockefeller's trap as a result, discounting Rockefeller in their thinking and leaving Ford 100 per cent in the spotlight. Because of considerations such as those I discussed last month, the effects of a default by New York City or State would not merely ripple through our economy. A tidal wave would be a better term. Even if the Federal Government or Federal Reserve does step in to apply financial band aid, the Rockefeller Brothers, through their control of the Federal Reserve System as well as the Government, have it within their own power either to intensify this process or to soften it. But as of now, they are preparing to pull out all the stops. Meanwhile, Government economic spokesmen are lying when they say our economy is recovering. The United States dollar is sinking overseas, and our domestic economy is on the ropes. Ready for a knockout punch from a New York default, stock market crash, or other such blow. A lot of attention is being paid especially to the effect a New York default would have on the nation's banks. Well, there are quite a few banks around the country that would be in trouble, but the big New York City banks owned by the Rockefellers are not among them. They hold vast amounts of New York City bonds, but that's in trust for other investors. The banks themselves do not own them. The Rockefellers, as I said before, bailed out months ago, and after the crash they will be thoroughly liquid, ready to buy up everything in sight for a penny on the dollar. Of course, they could force one of their own banks to fail for the sake of appearances, but if they do, it will be strictly voluntarily on their part. A more telling warning of the impact of default came from the Bank of America, the largest bank in the world and also controlled by the Rockefellers. They reveal that over two-thirds of New York City bonds are held by individuals, not banks. The life savings of many people are therefore directly at stake. The economic calamity now brewing in the United States is, as I have explained before, to beat us into such a submissive, submissive condition that we will accept a dictatorship under the new Rockefeller Constitution a year from now. Already the building attack on the food stamp program is leading into something called the Federal Work Job Program. It will seem to offer food and benefits to those in need as the Depression deepens, but at the expense of signing away your present constitutional rights in the fine print. Its actual purpose is the conscription of people into slave labor, which may not be immediately apparent since no barbed wire compounds will be involved at first. But when the time comes, 
They are scheduled to be packed up and sent to the Middle East to help reconstruct that area after the coming war, never to be heard from again. To get Americans to accept such schemes, the food shortages I have been warning about for over a year now are being engineered. One factor in this has to do with shutting off the flow of natural gas used to make fertilizer in California, which supplies up to 40 percent of some of the food supplies used in the United States. Another factor is the continuing shipments of grain to Soviet Russia on so-called sale terms which are only 10 percent down, the rest guaranteed by you, the American taxpayer. Official estimates of the Soviet grain crop keep being revised downward as an excuse and cover for additional shipments, but no evidence of Soviet crop failures has ever been given to the United States Agriculture Department, and it never will be because the alleged Soviet drought is fictitious. Instead, the Soviet Union is stockpiling for the coming, coming Asian War. As it now stands, my friends, the war in Asia could come as much as one year earlier than was indicated by my information just a few short months ago. As of now, the Rockefeller Brothers and their Soviet partners have set a target date of February 1976, just a few short months from now, for initiation of hostilities which are planned to begin in the Middle East. Such a shift in timing is unnerving, but so far the information I have been able to give you has been more accurate than that which Secretary of State Henry Kissinger sometimes provides in confidential briefings of top businessmen. For example, in the early fall of last year Kissinger briefed a group of about 100 American businessmen who do business in the Middle East and told them that by late spring of 1975 there will be war in the Middle East. The war he was talking about is the war that is now set to begin in February 1976. What Kissinger was really talking about was his diplomatic objectives. My own information, however, indicated that conditions would not be ripe yet for a Middle East war at least through the summer of 1975 and that information turned out to be correct. But the war preparations are indeed moving quietly now, and very quickly. First, David Rockefeller must obtain an International Monetary Agreement on exchange rates at the January meeting of the International Monetary Fund since a floating currency during wartime would be unmanageable. Meanwhile, in the diplomatic reign, Kissinger's Sinai Accord is the key feature. You may have been left with the impression by our kept press that the Sinai Accord is between Egypt and Israel, with 200 American technicians being sent there just as a sort of glue to make it stick. But my friends, this is just not the case. It is in reality two separate treaties, one between the United States and Israel the other between the United States and Egypt. They are executive agreements in effect being treaties, considered as being treaties. By ratifying these so-called treaties comprising the Sinai Accord, the United States Congress has sold the American people right down the road to war. They have now set the stage for America to be involved in something we have not had for 30 years a declared official war. The 200 American advisors or technicians, so-called, are already in the Sinai, as President Ford admitted in a slip of the tongue on Meet the Press November 9, 1975. And they have two purposes. They are the vanguard of a secret American Lebanon nuclear strike force, and they are also to be the deliberate targets for a provocation that will be used to ignite the war. Now that we are officially at peace with Egypt by way of the Sinai Accord Treaty, we will have to officially breach that peace, that is, declare war, 
in order to retaliate against this rigged attack on the Americans. The Anti-Zionism Resolution, which has just been passed in the United Nations, is also part of this plan. The Arabs have fallen into a terrible trap by pushing through this resolution, which will be used to whip up fears that Israel is being surrounded and will be snuffed out if America does not respond militarily to the provocative actions mentioned a moment ago. The fighting between Moslems and Christians in Lebanon has been fomented by Libya, which is controlled by the Rockefellers for two reasons. For one thing, the excitement there distracts attention away from the true, larger picture of war preparations in the Middle East. But even more importantly, the fighting in Lebanon has given the Rockefellers the excuse they wanted for pulling their own companies out of that area prior to the coming war. As of now, all the big U.S. multinational corporations formerly based in Lebanon have pulled up stakes and headed for London out of the war zone. The American foreign policy known as detente with Soviet Russia has, in reality, hardened into an alliance in spite of recent remarks by Secretary of State Kissinger for domestic consumption. While the United States bargains away its defense capabilities at the so-called SALT talks and receives nothing in return, Russia goes right on doubling and redoubling their military buildup with Kissinger and the President Ford and Rockefeller consent. Meanwhile the United States is being turned into a factory to supply the Soviet Union. The Rockefeller brothers think that they and the USSR will thus end up as partners ruling the world, but the horrible risk, my friends, is that they, are, that they are taking is that after the coming Asian War is out of the way, Russia will dub across the Rockefeller Brothers and take over the whole world for itself. Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger was fired by Nelson Rockefeller through his puppet President Gerald Ford because he was getting in the way of this alliance. Schlesinger ins insisted very properly that true detente must be balanced with a strong defense, and he refused to knuckle under. So he had to go, but as he went he said some words that should be burned indelibly into the mind of every American, and I want to quote here. Some years from now someone will raise the question, Why weren't we warned? And I wanted to be able to say, Indeed you were." Unquote. The Red Chinese can see what is developing. That is why they accorded Secretary of State Henry Kissinger such a frosty treatment during his recent visit. Red China is being encircled by the Soviet Union with the help of the Rockefellers through their manipulation of the wealth of the United States. Indochina has been delivered into Soviet hands in return for turning over the rich offshore oil leases of North Vietnam to the Rockefellers. The coming war is intended to suck up India, Red China, and all of Africa into complete domination by the Rockefeller-Soviet alliance. In the process it is also to slap down Europe and Japan, which are trying to squirm free of the Rockefeller bonds that already grip them. Here now is the grand strategy for the war, which I can reveal to you for the very first time, and as always I reveal it in the hope that doing so will throw a monkey wrench into these plans and cause them to fail. World War II was used by the Rockefellers to bring Britain down to her knees, as explained in my first AUDIO book last year, and also to make great inroads into Western Europe. Since World War II, Britain has been generally subservient to the Rockefellers, but lately both Europe and Japan which has been the special domain of John D. Rockefeller III since the war, are showing signs of struggling to break free. However, 99% of Japan's oil needs are supplied by the Middle Eastern Arab members of OPEC, 
and 67 percent of the oil needs of the European co uh, economic community come from there also. On top of that, India, one of the prime targets of conquest in the planned war, is also heavily dependent upon OPEC oil, and Africa, another target, leans heavily upon Europe for all kinds of support and will be easy picking if Europe is neutralized. The OPEC nations of the Middle East, therefore, hold many of the keys for accomplishment of the Rockefeller-Soviet joint objectives in the Asian War. Plans now exist for the Americans in the Sinai to be attacked and for over a hundred of them to be killed enraging Congress and public opinion in the United States. On top of that, the drumbeat which has begun with the United Nations Anti-Zionism Resolution will by then make it appear that Israel is in danger of extinction. War will thus be declared by then President Rockefeller's rubber stamp Congress. Cobra helicopter gunships have already been delivered secretly to the Sinai, and these will be equipped with air-to-ground tactical atomic missiles which have been in the Sinai secretly for two years under strict American control. After hostilities break out, this limited nuclear strike force is to put the OPEC oil wells out of action with atomic blasts. No nation in the Middle East including Israel and Lebanon, will escape radioactive fallout from this limited nuclear strike, and the oil wells themselves, due to radiation, will remain unusable and capped off for a period of approximately 10 years. The United States, which currently gets about 19 percent of its oil from the Middle East, will experience manipulated shortages far worse than those during the Arab oil embargo two years ago, and this will help further rip our domestic economy to shreds. But the effect on Europe and Japan will be far more drastic. At one stroke the heart of Europe will be crippled and completely at the mercy of the merciless Rockefeller Brothers, and Japan which is being rudely rebuffed by the Soviet Union and wooed by China these days, will be thrown fully into the arms of China. China has begun developing its own vast oil deposits and could provide some to Japan in return for an alliance against China's mortal enemy, the Soviet Union. Thus will the Sino-Japanese alliance be cemented. The already bitter clashes between China and Russia on the one hand, plus lesser skirmishes between China and Russia's client state India on the other hand, will set the stage for the larger Asian war which is planned to follow very quickly. Africa, cut off from its ties to Europe, will be like a ripe plum ready for the plucking by the Rockefellers, and this includes Rhodesia and South Africa. I turn now to Topic No. 2. The French have a saying that the more things change, the more they remain the same. How true that is and how tragic. It's been over a year and a half now since I first exposed the Fort Knox Gold Scandal during Congressional testimony. Long ago I offered publicly to go to jail as a rabble-rouser if I could pr not prove my charges in an appropriate legal forum. But has Congress acted? No. And now the gold manipulations have entered a new phase. Gold, my friends, is now coming back into the United States along with huge amounts of illegal drugs in return for American-made guns and weapons which are being sent abroad for use in wars, revolutions, and terrorism. The gold now coming in is not reflected in Treasury records. Instead, it is being hidden around the country by the CIA for the Rockefellers. The Rockefeller interests want to have it handy for sale to the government for war purposes or for other purposes at the elevated prices that will soon prevail. Meanwhile, as I revealed last month, the Fort Knox Gold story has taken a deadly new turn. 
and as before, Congress is doing absolutely nothing about it. The Central Core Vault of the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox contains canisters of liquid radioactive superpoison processed from Plutonium-239, the deadliest substance imaginable. These canisters are leaking due to corrosion, and the radioactive leakage is escaping through the porous concrete walls of the vault and through the dehumidifying system and getting out into the countryside to be carried away on the winds contrary to what officials tell you. The prevailing winds in that area for the past several years have been very unusual, from essentially due west rather than from the northwest, as is more common. As a result, the thin, invisible fog of radioactive poison from Fort Knox is being carried from the depository, which is located south of Louisville, eastward in the general direction of Lexington in West Virginia, and onward approximately toward Washington, D.C., and this leakage has already been going on for several years in sufficient quantity to be having an initial impact on health statistics now. My own investigators have reported to me that many doctors in the region east of Fort Knox are baffled lately by a large increase in the incidence of cancers of all types. And on November 7, 1975, just a week ago, the government itself released statistics that show the same thing. The National Cancer Institute announced that so far this year the cancer death rate nationwide is up by 5.2 percent. This is five times the rate of increase that has prevailed over a period of many years, and they frankly admit that they are at a loss to explain it. But buried in those same official government statistics is a regional breakdown, and the east-central states containing Fort Knox and the area east of it shows an astronomical 17 to 18 percent increase. But before I go on, there's something I feel I must make clear. And I am not just sitting back and saying, well, here's something sensational to talk about. Any such callous attitude on my part would be impossible. It so happens that my beloved father and other members of my family are in my childhood home of Huntington, West Virginia, smack in the path of the Fort Knox radioactive killer fog. They are among the millions of people who have already been exposed to the first whiffs of plutonium poison, and I fear for their lives if nothing is done to stop this leakage, which, it, which is steadily accelerating. And the feeling I have for them carries over to millions of others, men, women, and innocent little children, who are in the same boat, all because of the insane efforts of the Rockefeller Brothers to seize power at any cost and by any means. Some will also say, no doubt, that I shouldn't tell you things like this because it will cause alarm. But my friends, this is something to be alarmed about. It's no joke. If I did not tell you, I would be just like a civil defense official who, warned of an imminent attack by enemy bombing aircraft, would say, I'm not going to turn on the air raid sirens because that might frighten people. But you may say, wouldn't the government warn us and take the necessary measures to correct such a situation at Fort Knox? My answer is no. The government is stonewalling it. And up till now, major newspapers, news magazines, and the TV and radio networks are also sitting on this life and death story with one exception. Two days ago, on November 12, 1975, the Louisville Courier-Journal broke the Fort Knox plutonium story on its front page in the best traditions of newspaper reporting. Their courageous exercise of free speech, guaranteed by the First Amendment to our Constitution, 
may make it impossible even for the Rockefeller-controlled major media to ignore the situation indefinitely. In any case, top business and financial people here and abroad are being kept aware of the Fort Knox fiasco thanks to specialized newsletters of all kinds. While the major media try to brainwash you with slanted news and distract you with all kinds of entertainment, these newsletters tell what is really going on. One of the best of these, which began informing its readers about the strange goings-on at Fort Knox over a year ago, is Myers Finance and Energy, edited at Post Office Box 5531, Station A, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. In his October 31, 1975 issue, Mr. Myers caps off a story on Fort Knox by quoting the following letter of my able associate, Mr. Ed Durrell, to the Acting Director of the Mint, quote, I now ask you for the record, please to confirm or deny the existence of the Central Core Vault at the U.S. Bullion Depository at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I refer to the single large centrally located underground chamber serviced by elevator." Unquote. As Mr. Myers asks in his newsletter, quote, why can't the Acting Director of the Mint answer simply yes or no? The whole nation is asking a question. Why won't they answer? Unquote. For two, year, two months now we have received a dead silence from the government. Every one of their past evasions has confirmed and deepened their guilt, and they know it, so they are stonewalling it. What then is Congress doing? Is it too just writing off nine million people rather than sound the alarm and get the deadly situation at Fort Knox corrected? Yes. Listen. As just pointed out, the United States Government has to this day never admitted the existence of the Central Corps Vault, which was not mentioned to the hundred-odd visitors of Fort Knox last year on September 23, 1974. To admit its existence would all by itself prove that the so-called gold inspection visit by congressmen and newsmen was a total fraud, and also the so-called audit done by the GAO and the Treasury together. And since the Central Core Vault is where the leaking plutonium poison is, they want desperately to keep you from knowing that the vault exists. I'm now going to reveal previously confidential discussions which have been held between Congressman Otis Pike, Chairman of the House Intelligence Investigating Committee, and myself and associates. I'm making it public now because Congressman Pike himself has breached this confidentiality in the worst possible way by turning over our information without our consent to the Church Committee in the Senate. As I explained last month, Senator Church is already sitting on the plutonium poison story while he, plays ga while he plays games with you and me. And now, for whatever reasons, Congressman Otis Pike, too, has let America down. In mid-September I held private discussions with Congressman Pike about the situation at Fort Knox. At that time I did not yet know about the plutonium poison stored there, but I did know that the CIA and FBI were tied in with the theft of America's gold from Fort Knox on behalf of the Rockefeller brothers. He appeared to be genuinely interested and courageous as well, a quality which has virtually disappeared from the United States Congress today. But his major sticking point, which he came back to time and time again, was the Central Core Vault at Fort Knox. Its existence had never been admitted by the government, so Congressman Pike could not believe that it did exist. The number one requirement that he placed on us was therefore that we prove that the Central Core Vault does exist. So on September 26, 1975, we met again with Congressman Pike and two of his top staffers in his office, and this time we had with us no less than a former Commanding General of Fort Knox. Lieutenant General John L. Ryan, Jr., United States Army, retired. General Ryan commanded Fort Knox from 1956 to 1959. He had also served two earlier tours at Fort Knox, the first being in the late 1930s when he was placed in charge of the Army contingent that was assigned to help store the nation's gold in the Bullion Depository for the very first time. All the gold was put in the Central Corps Vault at that time having been constructed specifically for that purpose. 
the many small jail cell-like storage compartment seen, uh, compartments seen by the Fort Knox visitors last year were also in existence at that time, but were not intended for the storage of gold but for other valuables. General Ryan stated that for the entire duration of his long experience with Fort Knox the gold was always kept in the Central Corps vault. He also said that he was mystified as to why the gold would ever have been removed from the Central Corps vault and placed in the small jail cell compartments on the levels above which offer a much lower degree of security. Congressman Pike then asked us for certain further information, including specific connections between the Fort Knox affair and the intelligence community, which is within the jurisdiction of Congressman Pike's committee. We agreed to provide what he asked, and it was in following up the connection between Fort Knox and the intelligence industry that my sources informed me of the hideous plutonium poison in the Boolean Depository at Fort Knox. But when we returned to Congressman Pike, ready to provide witnesses and other evidence about the plutonium and other things, Mr. Pike's response had changed. It is now the classical position that it is all that is always used to say goodbye on Capitol Hill. Quote, we're too busy to work on this. Unquote. Our information given to him in confidence has been unceremoniously dumped on that dead letter office, the Church Committee and Congressman Pike's opportunity to stand head, shoulders, and waist above everyone else in Washington by simply doing his duty has been forfeited. Only an informed, aroused public can now move Congress in the right direction. One of the unanswered questions when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 5 last month was why this insane radioactive plutonium poison was ever made at all. Now I can tell you. During the early and mid-1960s, over 200 pounds of this super poison was made for the CIA and FBI intelligence communities. It was processed in four plants, two in Louisville, Kentucky, one in North Dakota, and one in Southern California. One thing it is handy for, in very small doses, is putting troublesome individuals out of the way. But why so much plutonium poison? for political blackmail, my friends. In 1966 the CIA uh, divided up this poison and sent about 60 pounds to each of four Latin American countries, Peru, Panama, Bolivia, and Argentina. There threats were made that it would be used to contaminate United States planned and built water aqueduct systems, can you imagine, unless certain political and economic actions were taken. In Argentina this successfully laid the foundation for the return to power of the Perón Group, and then the poison was no longer needed there. And so it was returned to the United States in 1968. But a problem arose. Where to store this illegal nuclear poison? CIA agents within the Treasury, however, knew that the Central Core Vault at the Fort Knox Bulling Depository was being emptied of gold and suggested that it be stored there. Uh, this was done with all but 12 grams, uh, less than half an ounce, uh, which the CIA extracted from one canister to experiment with. This 12-gram sample of the plutonium poison, whose full effects still were not fully understood at that time, was taken to the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico for evaluation purposes. During the experiments there, about 3 grams accidentally leaked into an underground water supply which was being used by twelve families in that sparsely settled area. All of them died quickly from the poison, and the CIA mounted an elaborate, elaborate cover-up, burying those innocent victims secretly. Perhaps you will recall, in fact, some strange news items several years ago about the sudden disappearance of some ranch folk out west, a disappearance that never was explained. Well. Now you know what happened. At about the same point in time, by the way, IT&T was involved in the so-called Molehole Project to drill deep into the Earth's crust for reasons which were never made clear publicly. Its purpose, I can reveal, was to reach a hypothetical underground world river, so-called, and contaminate it with the plutonium poison to deny its use to everyone. 
After spending vast amounts of taxpayers' money, it was abandoned as an impractical project. Insane? Yes. Fiction? No. The CIA agent who was put in charge of getting the poison to the Latin American countries under cover of his multinational company was named Harold Leroy White. Once he became fully aware of the details of the project, however, he became disgusted and sick at heart and decided to go to, guess who, Senator Barry Goldwater with the story. He arranged to see Goldwater but died on the way, apparently because his intentions became known to the wrong people. Whether Goldwater knew what White wanted to see him about is not clear from my information so far, but it does seem strange that we keep running into Senator Goldwater in all of this. First there was the crucial Chapter 12 of the unpublished Tatum manuscript on Fort Knox, which Goldwater obtained from Tatum's widow after Tatum's death under suspicious circumstances. Goldwater has never released the manuscript. Script even though I challenged him to do so in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 1 for June 1975. Now there is the Harold Leroy White case. Did Goldwater know what was afoot or not? And now he has come out in strong public opposition to any further investigation of the CIA and other United States intelligence agencies. What's going on here, Senator Goldwater? Since I first revealed the presence and leakage of the radioactive plutonium-239 superpoison in the central core vault at Fort Knox, I've been astonished by the failure of some people to stop and realize what it means. My associates and I were hoping to obtain a court injunction to open the vault and prove that the gold is gone. But now, God forbid, the whole depository should be abandoned immediately and covered up with a pyramid of lead, cement, and stone whatever it takes to shut off its deadly contents from the environment before its effects become a runaway disaster. It will be a pyramid with a poison core for thousands of years, but that is apparently the best that can be done now. Topic No. 3. If the Bolin Depository at Fort Knox is indeed abandoned and entombed under a giant pyramid to shut it off from the world, it would be an ironic symbol of the miscarriage of Rockefeller power and ultimately a symbol of the self-destruction which the four Rockefeller brothers are bringing upon themselves. If you would take out a $1 bill and look at the back as I talk, you will see what I mean by this irony. On the left side you will see the pyramid and eye symbol that today signifies the power of the Rockefellers. They did not invent this symbol, but in 1933 they appropriated it as their own property. In that year their puppet President Franklin D. Roosevelt came to power, and this symbol appeared on our money for the very first time, and it's been there ever since. Many people attach patriotic and religious meanings uh, to the various parts of this symbol, but that is not what it means to the Rockefellers who put it there. Uh, 1776 inscribed at the base of the pyramid refers uh, not to the founding of our Republic, but to May Day, 1776, the day celebrated today by the Communists and Radical Socialists the world over. The pyramid itself symbolizes the pyramid of power. At the bottom are you and I, the general public, and in successively smaller layers above us are fewer and fewer people with more and more power. Floating above the pyramid, seemingly unattached to it, is the very hub of power, the essence of which is secrecy, no visible connection with the rest of the pyramid, and spine, symbolized by the mysterious eye with a view in all directions. The words Novus Ordo Seclorum on the banner underneath mean New Order of the Ages, or freely translated New Deal. Little understood symbols like this are one way uh, our secret rulers have of signaling to one another the progress of their grab for power. Uh, they are all around us today, even on postage stamps, and you should watch for them. The same pyramid symbol often appears over Walter Cronkite's shoulder these days when he discusses the economy on CBS TV news. It is also embodied 
as a triangle at the top of the headboard and footboard of Nelson Rockefeller's celebrated $35,000 bed, which was designed by an artist of satanic symbols, Max Ernst. Another symbol to watch for on Walter Cronkite's uh, TV news is the Rockefeller Road to the Bicentennial emblem, showing a road heading uh, into the center of a circle of stars. Count the stars! There are not thirteen, but ten stars in the circle, standing for the ten new states which are to replace the fifty we now have under the new Rockefeller Constitution. The shake-up of the Ford Cabinet over the weekend of November 2 uh, coinciding with uh, Rockefeller's announcement that he will not run with Ford or as Vice President in 1976 is a clear signal that Ford's remaining days in office are distinctly numbered. CIA Director Colby and Defense Secretary Schlesinger were fired at Nelson Rockefeller's behest, but these unpopular moves were hung like an albatross around President Ford's neck by having him say, I wanted my guys. At the same time, Henry Kissinger was ostensibly taken down a peg. I have always warned that Kissinger would have to go as soon as Nelson, his longtime boss, made his takeover move because their egos will not permit them to work, actually work together without terrible friction. Kissinger knows this too, and is a little Hitler waiting in the wings under the illusion that he may be able to, to displace Nelson Rockefeller and become our dictator himself under the provisions of the new Rockefeller Constitution. But he has already begun to find out otherwise, and in all likelihood will be successfully removed from the scene regardless of what moves he may make against Nelson. What is already being called the Sunday Night Massacre by some of the barking dogs of the Rockefeller media is only a prelude to bigger shake-ups ahead. Once the onus of the coming crash is firmly stuck to President Ford, the stage will have been set for him to retire from the scene, voluntarily or otherwise, to be replaced by Nelson Rockefeller riding out on his white horse to save the nation just like FDR did in 1933. As it stands now, and please remember that they often change their plans uh, when they are spotlighted, the timetable is as follows. On or about November 20, 1975, New York enters another crisis on the way to default, which will probably come while Ford is off drinking tea in China. Also on November 20, Ronald Reagan, the consummate actor who is Nelson Rockefeller's good friend and America's most two-faced Trojan horse, will make an announcement about his own candidacy. On or about December 20, 1975, Nelson Rockefeller now plans to publicly take the reins of the presiden Presidency from the floundering President Ford, the new Herbert Hoover. Ford's image is already in the process of being torn to shreds in a systematic campaign now underway. On January 20, 1976, President Nelson Rockefeller expects to deliver his first State of the Union message, which is now being written secretly, and electrify Congress and the nation as he proposes the, proposes the writing of a new Constitution for America. He will speak of the moment as a solemn one in the nation's experience, a time when the past is being conditioned to the future and when a law fundamental to all other laws must again be created as it was by our Founders in another time of national trial. For the remainder of the Rockefeller scenario, ending with our acceptance of the new Constitution by national referendum on rigged voting machines, I refer you to my AUDIO BOOK No. 2 entitled The Fort Knox Gold Scandal and What It Means to You. Finally, around February 1976, war is supposed to break out in the Middle East to be followed by the Greater Asian War. Yes, my friends, this is what is going on. Meanwhile, our United States Congress is doing nothing whatever except playing games with you and me. Both the House and the Senate are packed with members who are totally ignorant of the big picture intimidated by Rockefeller power, and weakened by skeletons in their own closets. Interspersed among them are the Hugh Scotts, 
the William Proxmires, the Henry Royces, and the Hubert Humphreys on both sides of the aisle and in both Houses of Congress, who provide the active leadership to lead Congress and the nation down the primrose path being laid out for us by the Rockefeller Brothers. My friends, only public opinion, massive, powerful, focused public opinion will move Congress in the right direction. It is therefore up to us, you and me, our neighbors, our friends, to save our Constitutional Republic for ourselves and our children by becoming aware of the truth, spreading awareness of the facts to others, and focusing that awareness into such pressure on Congress that they will realize they must stop catering to the special interests dominated by the Rockefeller Brothers. I hope to have more to say in this vein soon, but for now use your own imagination, your own resources, and do what you can. The hour is late. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.